When the demon had gone out, the mute man began to sp spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking a, from him a sign from heaven. Have you ever wondered about that? He casts out a demon, and they're like, Show us something else. That just seems strange to me. But knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is divided, is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own place, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he has trusted and divides his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out from a person, it passes through a waterless places, seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to the house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house is swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other demons, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's a really interesting statement. But let's break it down. He's been in Galilee. He's been in Galilee with his disciples. They've been casting out demons. They've been healing diseases. He's uh, walked on water. He's done some pretty incredible things. And it says that the crowds in Galilee were generally receptive, pretty excited. But as he's moving towards Jerusalem, the audience is getting a little more, if I can be a little sarcastic, sophisticated. They, they, the, the folks from Jerusalem are not so easily wowed. They are a little more discerning. They, you know, Jerusalem saw a lot of action. They had a lot of healers in Jerusalem. They, that was the center of the cult of, of, of all Yahweh worship, the temple and all that excitement. So, you know, you got to do a little more than just throw out a demon, you know, to get the folks towards Jerusalem excited. They're going to need a little bit more. They're just not going to be wowed by all the stuff Jesus is doing. So their responses to Jesus are, are a little varied. And again, we'll deal with this next week, actually. But, you know, some are actually demanding Jesus perform for them. If you're really something special, then show us a real, you know, casting out demons and healings are nice. But, you know, we want to see something really spectacular. I find that very strange. So their response to Jesus says, when the demon had gone out, the moot man spoke, the people marveled. Now that, that's a standard Galilee thing going on. You know, when he was in Galilee, the people were always marveling. But some, some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, and kept seeking a sign from heaven. Now, you know, you got to wonder when someone says, oh, he's casting out demons, okay, but maybe he's doing it in the name of the prince of demons. It seems like a strange response. And others are saying, well, let's, let's have him, you know, you know, set the heavens on fire or something to really prove who he is. And again, it, it's, it's amazing that they could look at something good that Jesus is doing. I mean, most of us would agree if someone has a demon and Jesus takes it out, that that's a good thing. And yet they're looking at that and saying, you know, I think he's just doing that because Satan, he's working with Satan. 
Oh, yeah, sure, it looks good. Oh, sure, the guy's free from this horrible, tormented existence, but, you know, is it really from God? And they're starting to question. And again, put yourself in Jesus' shoes or sandals, whatever may be appropriate. You're the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And someone attributes your work for the coming of the kingdom to Satan. That's just not a good idea. So they had a mixed response. You see, they recognized he was doing Messiah kind of type things. They recognized that Jesus was was shaking things up, that he was challenging the authorities, that he was teaching a little differently, teaching as one with authority. And that he was saying a lot of things that didn't exactly agree with what was coming from the Sanhedrin, from the the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. And in fact, they'd heard stories that he even kind of made fun of them on occasion. They heard that he ate with, with those other people, the tax collectors and the sinners. And so they're 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 wondering is this he's doing messiah kind of like stuff but he's not fitting the messiah mold that we had they don't know how to react and when they see these things they've got to sort of it it sort of confronts them with the fact that you've got to make a decision and again i think this is what luke is doing as he writes his gospel when you confront jesus and what he's doing you kind of have to make a decision Is he the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Is he the one that was promised and has been foretold and prophesied about through all the Old Testament? Is this the one? And if you don't like him as the one, you've got to come up with some other sort of explanation. And you know what? We're dealing with the same issue today. When the world confronts Jesus Christ, when the world deals with the historical nature of Jesus Christ, I always got a kick out of that when when, when my children started questioning. They were like, you know, Dad, if if Jesus was really such a big deal, then wouldn't historians outside the Bible mention him? I said, well, they did. Shock. Well, like who? I said, Josephus. And of course, smart aleck kids these days, they got on the computer. Josephus, Jewish historian that talked about Jesus. Hmm. Anyone else? Well, there was Tacitus of Rome. It, it almost made them mad. There were historians outside the Bible that mentioned Jesus. They couldn't believe it. But what I liked was, once again, they were confronted. Was he really who he said he was? Was he really who dad says he is? They kept coming up with weird questions trying to to sort of pull the rug out from under it just to to check and, and they kept finding. We went to the Holy Land this uh, past July and, and there were so many things that just gave ample evidence. Whether you believe that Jesus was the Son of God or not, you can't deny there was somebody named Jesus in Jerusalem right when the Bible says he was there. Just a whole lot of physical evidence. A whole lot of historical testimony outside the scriptures. You kind of have to deal with it. There was a man named Jesus there right then. Now was he the Christ, the Son of God? That's what these folks are dealing with. He's either the Messiah or he must be casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. You've got to come up with some other explanation if you don't accept who he says he was. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. Jesus just sort of points out your argument has got some holes in it. 
doesn't really work if Satan's casting out himself in the name of himself. It's kind of dumb. It's really foolish. It doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, kingdoms advance and take ground. They don't, they don't give up ground just, you know, to try to fake someone out. And Satan doesn't throw out demons in his own name. He doesn't free people. He, he, he captures them. He imprisons them. He enslaves them. Satan doesn't relieve people of torment. He brings on more. If you know who Satan is, you know Satan doesn't cast out demons. He tries to put more in. Because that's who he is. It is God who relieves and frees those who are captive. He says, if Satan is divided against himself, his kingdom, how will his kingdom stand for you? Say, I cast out demons in the name of Beelzebub. I think... I don't know how Jesus was not offended by this. I don't know how you could be the son of God, the son of Yahweh, the Messiah that had been prophesied, who had come to this point, and to have the people you've come to save say, you're really Satan. The other Gospels, Jesus responds much more harshly to this, but that's not what Luke is pushing for at this time. He doesn't quite leave it alone, though. The finger of God. When you hear the finger of God, does that conjure up any stories for you? You guys remember the story where, where the Persian king is there and he's having a party and he's so full of himself, he says, bring out all the uh, special utensils from the temple of the Jews. We'll show who was really powerful, their God or us. And he, he brings out all their stuff, and they start having this nice meal. And if you haven't read this story, you need to wait for a really dark and stormy night. And read in kind of whispered tones while they're having dinner. A hand appears, just a hand, and starts writing. Whenever the Jews heard the finger of God, that was one story that came to mind. When the finger writes, you know, you, you've been weighed and measured, and you've been found wanting, and the, it's the death sentence for that pagan king. God wanted to let him know, yeah, I'll let you know who's really powerful. The hand and the finger of God appeared. But this actually goes back a little further. Jesus tells him, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I want you to really let that impact. If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom has come upon you. Now that would have cast, that would have brought up another memory. You see, there was this great story in the Old Testament where Moses shows up. He starts putting the ten plagues of Egypt on the Egyptians. And if you've been raised in the church, you're familiar with some of these stories. But you may not be familiar with this particular verse. They go through several miracles. You know, he throws the staff down and turns into a snake. But Pharaoh's magi magicians are able to duplicate it. And he, he turns the Nile red, but the Pharaoh's magicians are able to duplicate some of that. And he, he does a, a, another couple of things, and the magicians can keep doing it, but he finally he gets to the gnats. And you've got to wonder why it was the gnats. But, but he gets to the gnats, and Pharaoh's magicians cannot duplicate it. And Pharaoh says, what's going on? And Pharaoh's own magicians look at him and say, this is the finger of God. His own holy men, spirit men, shaman, witch doctors, whatever you want to call them. They, they kept looking at all these things and they managed to duplicate him and they were trying to perform but they finally get to this particular one and they look at Pharaoh in the eye and they say this, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as Yahweh had said. 
Now, I know we may not be familiar with this passage of Scripture, but I guarantee you most first century Jews probably were. The story of the Exodus, the story of the ten plagues of Egypt, the, those stories were told over and over and over. They, they knew their history. They knew what God had done for them in the past. So when Jesus says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you, this passage would have come to mind, and not just the finger of God part, but the rest of it, I think, is why Jesus brings this particular phrase up. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, as, and he would not listen to them. You see, these are the people that are seeing Jesus perform great miracles, acts of God, and they're not listening. Just like God knew they wouldn't. You read first, you read John, that opening section of John. It says, Jesus came to those who were his own, but those who were his own did not know him. Isaiah, he says, you're ever listening, but you're not hearing. And it's, it doesn't matter what I do, you, you refuse to listen to me, no matter how much I plead with you. So Jesus is here, he's performing miracles. And he's letting them know if the finger of God is the power I'm using. You need, to, you need to kind of figure out that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that come upon you can be good or it can be bad, depending on how you respond to it. That's what Jesus is telling them here. Then he goes in to talk about the whole strong man thing, and I think a lot of us kind of read that story and don't really know what's going on, but he, Jesus is basically saying, Satan's powerful. He's got, he's got skills. And, and, and if he you know, protects his house and starts building his kingdom and wants to attack the earth, it, it, he's, he's a pretty tough guy, but when someone stronger shows up, he is disarmed. He has no protection. And the fact that you just saw me throw out a demon shows you or should show you that someone stronger than Satan has just showed up. Has in fact always been there. And then there's this little strange section. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. But I'm sure all of you remember the sermon I preached three or four weeks ago. Where he said, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. Now, I don't know about you, but has that ever struck you as a little odd? I mean, these seem to contradict each other. And that's only within a couple chapters. In one place he says, for whoever is not against you is for you, but over here he says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Seems to kind of, you know, there's, there's those people out there that just say, well, you know, the Bible contradicts itself, but this seems to be one of those places, right? Unless you really get into it. Now see, in the first instance, this is where Jesus' disciples come up and, and they're casting out demons and, and they come up and said, hey, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we told them to stop because they're not one of us. They don't know the secret handshake. They're not authorized. They're out of control. I mean, we could have people just running around casting out demons in your name all over the place and not know what's going on. And Jesus says, don't stop him. He's casting out demons in my name and they're coming out. We've got a convert. He may not have started out a convert, but I guarantee you by the end of it, he's a convert. If you see the power of God at work, you're going to know. And we have got that great story in Acts where, where 
so on as uh, some Jewish magician or something, but they were, they were casting out demons in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Remember that story? That's a great story. The demon says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know you, and it beats them up and, and they all run out of the house naked. I think they might be want to be converts too. Even the demon knows who they're talking about, but they know you're not really with them. See, the demons know. But Jesus says, look, if he's casting on demons in my name, don't stop him. They're, they're with us. Now here again, in the context of throwing out a demon, the people, some of the people have responded with, he's casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. Okay, they're not with us. See, the folks that are casting out demons in my name, they're with us. Don't stop them. But if they're claiming I'm casting out demons in the name of the prince of demons, they're clearly not with us. Definitely leave them out. These things are actually saying the same thing. They're not contradicting. And then Jesus goes on, and I think this is really fascinating, because we're all, we're all kind of, you know, caught in the story of, of throwing a demon out. And we've even had great modern movies, you know, The Exorcist, and, and all those sort of things where you see these great struggles with getting rid of demons. And I've always been amazed at Hollywood, who doesn't believe in God, but boy, they sure seem to believe in evil and make a lot of movies about it. And the theology is usually pretty messed up. Sometimes it's pretty good, but usually messed up. But they seem to believe in it. But, but here, Jesus is telling his audience, don't get too excited about casting a demon out. Because that's not the important thing. He tells this story about this, this demon that, that leaves and wanders around and can't find any place to stay and decides to go back. And, and the person has cleaned everything up. Their mind is back in order, and it's really great. It's a, it's a great party house again. And, and not only does he, you know, come back, but he brings some friends. He's saying, you know, if you don't replace Satan with Jesus Christ, you're asking for trouble. Now, we all know this, right? I mean, anybody that's been to counseling or read any kind of psychology books knows that if you want to stop something, you have to replace it with something. You know, if you want to stop thinking about bad things, you can't just sit there and say, don't think about bad things, don't think about bad things. Because then all you're doing is thinking about bad things. You have to actually do something different. You want to change a habit. I had a friend of mine who struggled with alcoholism and he said, you know, every day I drive home and there's this bar on the way home and I, I just have to pull in. I, I tell myself not to and I just have to pull in. And I don't know what to do. I just, I seem powerless. And I said, why don't you change the way you go home? Drive home a different way. I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. The next time we talk, he said, it's great. I, I, I just drove home a different way, and I don't see that bar, and I don't pull in anymore. You've got to replace your behavior with something else, something more positive, more constructive. Jesus is saying, if, if the demon goes out and you don't make any changes, you don't stop doing the things that invited the demon in in the first place, you, you understand what I'm talking about here? Do you know that you can invite Satan in without even thinking about it? I mean, I know most of you fairly well. And I know that none of you would wake up someday and say, you know what, I, I think I'll invite Satan in today. But you know, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger lest you give Satan a foothold. If you walk around bitter and angry all the time, you're inviting Satan in. You spend too much time 
Start looking at things on the internet that you shouldn't. Pornography, even violence. It's an open invitation to say. There's a lot of things that we can do that invite Satan in while we're not looking. And once you get rid of him, and I don't know if you've had that experience. I have. I've had some things. I've certainly struggled with violence, bitterness. And I've had those moments, those great freeing moments in my life. Where Jesus took those things away from me. But if I went back to thinking about all the bad things that happened to me in my past and all the things that I still need to be bitter about, they just came right back. And I had to pray all over again for Jesus to remove them. If we don't change our behavior, if we don't change the way we're approaching life, may I emphasize approaching life eternally we just invite the demons back in again and that's what Jesus is saying he say, okay I can cast the demon out but if the behavior doesn't change the demon's going to look around and just like Arnold he'll be back <laughs> and he'll bring some friends that's what Jesus is telling him. Don't, don't get impressed with the demon being thrown out. Let's, let's talk about keeping the demons out because otherwise the last state of the person is worse than the first. You don't want to go there. So what's our call to action? I found this last little section interesting. And a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you. She's basically calling down a blessing on Jesus' mother. And who wouldn't want their mother to get blessed, right? Jesus has a strange response. He says, no, blessed is rather those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, you, know, you, you read that, you think, was, it, was he slamming on his mother? No, don't bless my mother. Is that what he's saying? I think Jesus loved his mother a great deal, and I think she was blessed but not because she was chosen to give birth to Jesus, but because she heard the word of God and put it into practice. After all, that's what she said. The angel came to her and said, you're going to have the child. She said, I am your servant. Do what you will. Jesus is letting him know, and this is one of, one of Luke's themes, so you need to listen to this part. Blessed, rather, are those who hear God's word. And he doesn't stop there. And as a minister, I feel obligated to point out he doesn't stop there. You can hear the word of God. I can hear the word of God all day long, seven days a week. If I don't put it into practice it is useless. Not only is it useless, it's, it's endangering. Just like Jesus said, hey, the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. The word of God has come into you. You can respond positively and reap great eternal rewards. Or you can respond negatively. And there's some eternal rewards involved there too, but it's not good. There is no neutral ground when it comes to God. And there's a lot of people that seem to think, you know, I, I love talking to these people. Oh, I have a personal relationship with God. I don't need to go to church. Think, eh, you're obviously not as good a relationship as you think, as if you, and I've told them that. I said, if you have a really good relationship with God, he's going to tell you to find a church because that's who he is. And so if, if the God you have a personal relationship with isn't telling you to get involved with God's people, then I, I'm not sure who he is, but he's not the God of the Bible. 
You've got to hear and put it into practice. Jesus isn't disrespecting his mother. He's just telling them who's all going to get blessed. The one who is truly blessed is he who hears the word and then does something about it. That's critical. So I pray this week, and hopefully for the rest of our lives, that we will hear God's word. That during this week of Thanksgiving, we will truly recognize how blessed we are who live in this nation. And that we'll take our focus off all the wrongs that have been done to us and start really thanking God for all the blessings. But to remember that God blesses us so that we can bless others. Everything God gives us he expects us to turn around and pour out on others. If he gives you grace, extend it to others. I've been amazed when I counsel with people that they're all too happy to accept God's forgiveness. They have a hard time extending that out sometimes. And that God's very clear about that. If you won't forgive others, I, I'm not going to forgive you. That's the way it works. Whatever God gives us, if God has loved you, Take that love and pour it out on someone else. This week, if God's given you mercy, if God has given you rich blessings, if God has given you Bible knowledge, if he's given you wisdom and insight, turn around and share that in the name of Jesus with the people that God has placed in your life that he wants to reach. Whatever your needs are now, please come as we stand and sing.